Having this true curiosity on the Randy Show. I'll I'll make a small uh, sure. statement here about allopathy. Sure. Right. So we equate the term allopathy to modern medicine. Sure. Right. All the time. I mean, even our media do it, and it's it's very inherent to uh, India, uh, where people call modern medicine as allopathy. But I think everybody should know that allopathy is not modern medicine, because allopathy was a term coined by the person who uh, invented homeopathy. So homeopathy is basically German invention. It's a German physician. Uh, his name is Samuel Hahnemann. He invented homeopathy because during the early century, I mean 1800s and all, uh, there were no actual treatments or for diseases. And so it was a time when the light bulb was not invented. You know, early 1800s. So at that time, if somebody had a headache, people used to drill a hole in the skull to reduce the headache. Uh, people used to bring the blood out. That is known as bloodletting. to reduce the headache or if people have some infection and all i mean they never knew that the germ theory the infectious causes for disease also was not known at that time so there was crude forms of treatment which were actually very painful and torturous for the patient so this guy samuel hanneman felt very bad about it so he in invented a, a system of medicine which was very gentle so in the process what he did was to give very diluted forms of medications which actually contains nothing ultimately which has very diluted forms to treat lot of diseases that is what homeopathy is so to uh, distinguish to differentiate homeopathy from that crude form of treatment that uh, was actually given at that time he called it as allopathy mm. so allopathy was a, an ancient uh, heroic type of med crude medicine that was practiced in early 800s it has nothing to do with modern medicine so when people talk say allopathy i always correct them and say it's not allopathy because allopathy is now obsolete because after the invention and after the after we have now scientific medicine coming up that term is now uh, buried what would you substitute that term i would call it as just medicine because medicine is medicine and then you have alternative medicine so if alternative medicine is found to be useful it becomes medicine yeah yeah um some people also call it as science based medicine which is sbm another group calls it as evidence based medicine which is ebm hmm but i would just say it as medicine okay i'll tell you what what i am trying to attempt through this conversation is one to understand your strong stance on uh, ayurveda and homeopathy and two to improve my own understanding of all these things without completely discounting any of the three yeah so i mean i would like to take this as an opportunity to say that see i'm i'm not going to i'm not here to convince everybody is about right or wrong but what i'm going to give here or talk about here is plain simple ra rational and logical approach sure. to healthcare simple so uh, the first is let me give you an example uh, imagine if i have a patient comes to me with jaundice so jaundice is not the disease it is actually uh, a, a a symptom associated with a disease so jaundice can be because of a liver disease it can also be because of a blood disorder a blood disease so jaundice is a symptom the patient feels it patient can see that the eyes are yellow and the urine is yellow that is jaundice and even the doctors can see that the eyes are yellow so it becomes a symptom and a sign which doctors can also see it's jaundice now when i approach that jaundice patient what will i do i'll work him up for the causes of jaundice so i'll first look at hepatitis viruses causing jaundice i'll see if the patient is having significant amount of alcohol use i'll see if this patient is on any specific drugs which can cause jaundice because there are drugs that can harm the liver so i'll 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 look at all of these and ultimately i'll figure out yes the jaundice is because of this disease uh, imagine it is hepatitis b the jaundice is because of that so i give him a medicine for hepatitis b and the jaundice is gone so he gets cured from the jaundice because he got cured from the hepatitis b so the medicine is an antiviral which is a, a drug that acts against hepatitis b and then he is fine now imagine the same person going to a ayurveda ayurveda has no concept of root cause even though we keep hearing root cause root cause in alternative medicine practice they have no concept they have a concept of treating symptoms only but not diseases so jaundice in ayurveda is just jaundice you know they'll come with jaundice and they have these ancient texts which was written ages ago by these uh, sages at the time based on observation and faith and belief 
but not tested not validated not experimented on without any other replication that means so some for some treatment to be useful to be recommended or approved a large number of people large number to... of people has to be tested and it has to be from different groups so i make a drug and i say that this drug is good for this doesn't make sense because another group also has to say it so i, I it, otherwise it becomes a bias from my side so it's my drug so i say it's good but that is known as uh, validation and replic- replicability so this is all part of scientific medicine in ayurveda it's it's not there so it is not validated not tested you cannot falsify it in the sense that you cannot change it because it's already fixed in the textbook that in this case you have to give this only mm. right so the different causes for jaundice so if somebody comes with hepatitis b or somebody comes with uh, hepatitis a jaundice or somebody comes with alcohol hepatitis jaundice ayurveda treats them all same which is actually not right by the patient because patient deserves to be treated for the disease that is causing the jaundice so which is why i say that ayurveda is a pseudo science in the sense that do you do you think all of it is a pseudo science of course because the principles are all the same it's it's, it's based on vata pitta kapha and it's based on the ele- based on the elemental theory of disease formation and if you ask an ayurved what a vata is what a kapha is how do you measure it please show it to me they can't they'll go philosophical so it's it's a philosophy of treatment in ayurveda and all that there's a lot of philosophy a lot of belief and faith and all attached to it so which is why i say that for realistic healthcare these are not good options for people to go for now you'll hear stories that you know ayurveda has actually improved certain conditions so this skin disease is there it's gone or this asthma was there it's gone this jaundice is there it's gone because of ayurveda i mean you do hear it i mean i get a lot of such responses also so that is where the natural history of disease comes in so every disease so like for example we are all born one day we have this life expectancy and we die this is how life goes same with the disease so there are diseases which start which keeps going very long those are chronic diseases and there are diseases which start and they take a course and then they automatically come down after few years or few weeks or few months whatever take the example of childhood asthma like we spoke in the in the beginning i was an asthmatic child uh, i used to take a lot of inhalers and i used to be admitted for asthma attacks and all i used to take a lot of medicines including steroids as need be during my childhood but by the time i was 12 years 13 years my asthma is gone because childhood asthma majority of childhood asthma will go away at a certain age there are other forms of asthma which can come later in adulthood for for that it's a it's a different treatment so somebody will start asthma medications at the age of 5 years imagine modern medicine so they're taking this taking this but asthma attacks keep coming in between now it's for 5 years 6 years 7 years 8 years 9 years 10 years of age they have tried modern medicine 6 years they have tried modern medicine now they are not happy so they say okay let's try ayurveda so they try ayurveda in between this also so now they go for ayurvedic treatment and they do it for 2 years so now already the child is 10 years of age so in 2 years they try ayurveda and by the time the child is 12 years of age asthma is already gone because it is supposed to go away at that time because that is a natural history of childhood asthma but what would the parents feel the parents will feel that okay we started ayurveda now so ayurveda has cured the disease mm. because it was started the last so mm. they feel that it is a bias it this was started so it has gone but in reality the asthma is supposed to go away at the age of 12 and it has gone on its own and nothing ayurveda has nothing to do with it so this is why we have to define anecdotal experiences from scientific evidence yeah. okay right so this is my my take on ayurveda versus scientific evidence and the same with homeopathy mm-hmm. homeopathy has a different set of principles altogether which are absurd it is made by samuel hahnemann only where he claims that something that can cause a disease in very dilute forms it can cure the disease which is impossible so basically if i have alcohol That's liver disease venom theory yeah so ah uh, i mean that is anti venom you're giving anti venom against the uh, snake venom but this is not like that so imagine i have alcohol liver disease so if i give myself diluted forms of alcohol i can cure the alcohol liver disease i mean it doesn't it doesn't work that way you know something that causes a disease cannot cure the disease so there are separate set of principles similar to what in ayurveda because it cannot be tested and it cannot be experimented because the principles themselves are very weak and illogical hmm okay uh i have no perspective on homeopathy never been through it never even spoken to anyone who 
has wow. practiced homeopathy so i have no perspective i have some perspective on ayurveda through the show and through uh, you know even like lifestyle coaches and all who've been on the show uh, in my eyes i don't so first of all i'm from a medical family like so my parents have like drilled uh, your kind of logical thinking into my system as well in terms of what you spoke about that if you see someone with jaundice the way your mind works as a doctor like a medical doctor is that you'll find the pathway to the root cause yes and then the medicine and whatever you've learned and the constant education that you're doing even now will lead you to the solution you cure the root of or the problem or control it or control it yeah. uh and then what you see on the surface will also start getting cured exactly and you're improving health that way exactly uh my first thought if i am ever ill is to obviously go to a doctor like yourself uh but as a consumer because i am meeting such crazy people on the show like i've met people who practice some kind of alternative medicine in south america which is ayahuasca and all these things okay uh have you heard of ayahuasca no no okay uh, yeah. like as in i'm there's lo- there's a botany uh, phd i've had on the show called mark plotkin okay. his whole life is dedicated to plant medicine in south america okay. and one of the active ways he makes money is that he consults uh big pharmaceutical companies who try making uh medicines hmm. based on his research from the world of botany okay so i can't remember the name of the exact plant but uh, re- serpentine re- reserpine re- uh, yeah reserpine yeah. serpentine yeah. that is raulfia serpentina serpentina correct yeah. uh so i'm just giving one example yeah, yeah. uh that drug i what is it used for so so it's used for uh, high blood pressure high blood pressure yeah so that is not from uh, south american uh, knowledge that's actually from ayurveda knowledge so in ayurveda even now uh, the ayurved practitioners treat high blood pressure by giving the extract of this particular plant known as raulfia yeah. serpentina yeah so the active component in that is reserpine 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 yeah. now reserpine was initially used as a bp control agent but now it is completely stopped because it has lot of side effects including depression and suicidal thoughts so that is no more used because we have no safer uh, anti bp i mean uh, bp lowering medications at the moment so the traditional i mean I, i'm not denying the fact that we have natural sources of medicine yeah that, so that's what i was getting yeah. towards with ayurveda exactly now if we look at ayurveda's contribution to any particular medicine or a drug that we use currently now it is zero if you look at traditional chinese medicine there is something known as artemisin which is an anti malarial drug which was fda approved and all that which is one of the most common drugs that we use in uh, to treat malaria that knowledge came from traditional chinese medicine but it was not traditional chinese medicine practitioners who actually discovered that it was actually modern medicine practitioners and modern pharmacologists who identified it based on the texts that they studied from traditional chinese medicine such a similar discovery or drug discovery from ayurved does not exist so we have lot of knowledge about plants and their effects in the human body we also have a huge database where we know what what plant contains what all molecules and what all compounds these are these are there i mean it's not like it's waiting to be discovered this is already there there's a huge repository a database of all the chemical components active components in every plant i'll give you a very simple example so there is this uh drug called i mean there is this plant called ashwagandha so ashwagandha is heavily uh, talked about in ayurvedic literature uh, people consume it for anxiety stress relief and things like that some gym goers do it to improve their oxygen toler- i mean their tolerance and oxygen capacity and all that but there are studies i mean it's already known that what all does ashwagandha contains so ashwagandha contains a particular compound called withanolide a that is withanone a which has been shown to damage dna of the liver cell now this is this is a fact i mean there's a huge study that has shown that the withanone a component of ashwagandha herb can actually damage the liver cell especially by damaging the dna which is why we are now getting a lot of patients with ashwagandha related liver injury even in my practice and across the globe mm. so we just recently published the largest series of ashwagandha liver injury from our unit in the official journal of uh, american association of study of liver diseases which is the journal known as hepatology communications a fantastic journal high impact factor 
peer reviewed publication where we showed that there are people who actually develop uh, liver injury because of certain herbs and the component in the herb that causes the liver injury is this so what we have to do is that if we are going to identify a particular natural compound from a particular plant we have to ensure that that natural compound is what we require and it is beneficial and safe instead of using the whole plant okay hypothetically speaking if um some big institute carries out very very detailed tests on ashwagandha again and and this is this is my issue with studies in general and you can talk about dr huberman here also or generally studies i feel you have to study two opposing studies together and then look within the nooks and crannies to like find gaps in both and then come to the yeah truth. i mean it, it's very simple you know the scientific method is quite simple you know you have a hypothesis you have a theory like for example so i know that ashwagandha is going to reduce stress so i know this because it's already written in maybe classical text ancient text and now we have some data from pre preclinical studies preclinical means before human studies are taken up we do the studies in in the cells or tissues or in small animals so from that we have some data that you know this ashwagandha is reducing stress levels now what in ashwagandha is reducing stress level is the next question yeah now we don't want the whole ashwagandha we want that particular part of it so it may be one compound it may be two compounds it may be three compounds but we have to identify it now you take extract those one or three compounds and then test it again in animals and see that they are actually causing this beneficial effect with lesser side effects yeah. that, so if exactly everything will I'm have side effects about. but you need more benefits than side effects oh. now you know that in animals it is safe so let's move on to humans mm. so in humans we have phase 2 phase 3 and phase 4 studies where we look at larger groups of people we control for lot of other things and then look at safety and everything and in humans we identify that you know this particular compound or three compounds reduces stress levels and this is what is going to be used as a drug in the future we have to go through all of that yeah. so what is now happening is that people are just promoting ashwagandha okay take so this first us i think what i'm understanding about you as a medical practitioner is that your problem is this carpet bombing of advice that exactly for this problem take ashwagandha yeah, it's not yeah. like that no it's not like that it has to be refined so that you are know that the person who's getting it is going to benefit from it more than getting a side effect and when if if you use the sentence ayurveda is a pseudo science then a consumer would view it as you're completely against the world of plants <laughs> so yeah so the ayurveda is not about plants i think this is what i think people should actually understand ayurveda is not about plants so plant medicine is different so we have herbal medicine we have traditional medicine we have complementary medicine we have alternative medicine there are different forms of medicines which uses plants ayurveda is not about plants ayurveda is a principle hmm. so it's it's a it's a healthcare which includes some principles in it which is what we are looking at so uh, in scientific medicine what is the principle the principle is scientific method so you have to identify something as beneficial or not based on testability falsifiability validity and replication mm. this has to be there in ayurveda it's based on beliefs and observation which is done in the past without further testability accountability or any other uh, changes that has been made so something that is written 3000 years back following it again in 2024 doesn't make sense so that is what i'm calling as pseudo science i'm not calling as, as that plant part as pseudo science i'm calling the principles as pseudo science so the whole of ayurveda if you take away the principles it ceases to exist god god so fair to say that uh, from all the stuff written in ayurvedic texts there might be some things that need to be studied further and then can be applied into modern medical science exactly well. so there will be something there that we can actually use for drug discovery okay so drug discovery is actually one of the most powerful arms of scientific medicine it has nothing to do with traditional medicine or alternative medicine but don't you think it can get inspiration from aspects of traditional medicine yeah so we borrow observational knowledge or observed uh entities from traditions but then what we do to it is based on the scientific method sure because if you leave it to the traditional healers to find a cure for hepatitis mm. b they will never mm. right they will still be stuck on that herb that i used that time that is the only herb they'll be stuck like that but mm. you put it in a scientific method they will find what in that herb actually did that mm. and then make it a drug i mean i have read the whole of ayurveda text 
which is taught as part of curriculum in BAMS. So there is a Bachelor of Ayurvedic Medicine and Sciences that is taught in India. It's a five-year course. They have all these textbooks in the curriculum. I have all those textbooks in my uh, house. Yeah. Um, it happened so because when I was actually talking about Ayurveda practices and products, not practice per se, products related uh, liver injury, uh, of which I have the first publication in the world, a um, lot of patients actually died because of herbal liver injuries and we had to transplant some. It's a huge, it was a huge uh, study. That is, is it something related to heavy metals? So heavy metals were part of it. But then there are also inherent toxic plants also. There are some plants which are very harmful for the liver. For example, giloy, Gynospora cordifolia, which is giloy that we commonly call as guduchi. It's very toxic to the liver. Ashwagandha in some people are very toxic. Green tea is a very toxic thing to the liver. Green tea extracts. So there are plants that are toxic to the liver. So when we start, we published that particular uh, study and started talking about it, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, backlash because people did not understand uh, the whole aspect of how uh, we approach it. You know, it's it's from this, from this scientific medicine perspective, from, from evidence-based point of view. So instead of publishing on side effects, we actually need to actually publish on the benefits of it. So, which, which is why I, I uh, say that, you know, it's not just uh, the herbals that are part of Ayurveda. Ayurveda is a huge uh, thing. I mean, it's a huge practice. And what I learned, read from the texts of Ayurveda, what, what they were teaching in the colleges is that uh, it's mostly to do with, to, you know, just practicing it. You know, you find a person, you look at whatever the principles they follow, and then you serve them this particular bunch of herbs or whatever. And it contains, it may contain heavy metals as part of the preparation, or it may be a contamination or adulteration of it. Or it might be that plant which is already toxic that is causing the problem. So that is a whole aspect yeah. of what I have found from my own clinical research yeah. work. Um, the only fair way to do this breakdown conversation is to actually have an Ayurveda expert with you who's as eloquent as you. To, and for you guys to talk. So, uh, and I'm giving yeah, I a know. consumer perspective here. I, I understand. I mean, I have invited a lot of Ayurvedas to talk on Clubhouse, talk on Twitter. They don't come. They don't come. I mean, I'm inviting them. Anybody wants to have a realistic conversation on how to approach patients and diseases from an Ayurvedic perspective versus a scientific medicine perspective, I will guarantee that I can change their way of thinking on how medical science actually works. This is something known as uh, appeal to antiquity, which means that just because something was there for so long doesn't mean that it is actually useful. For example, um, we've had modes of transportation, which was possibly uh, bullock carts many, many decades ago or centuries ago or animal based modes of transport. But at that time it was good. But now we have better modes of transport. So we use them now. So just because it was good at that time doesn't mean it is better now or can be considered equal to the modes of transportation that we have now. So that is that is known as appeal to antiquity. It's a logical fallacy which a lot of people actually make. And the second aspect is that uh, about mixing both. So you have a scientific evidence-based practice and you have this traditional wisdom or knowledge and you include that also in this to get best of both worlds. This is what is classically known as integrative medicine. So I have right. a yeah integrative medicine. So integrative medicine is you you have scientific medicine or real medicine and then you put in some alternative medicine also into it to see you getting the best of both worlds and a lot of people practice it. Uh, what I'm going to say might uh, might not be uh, very digestible for people, but the way I see integrative medicine is you have a glass of apple juice and you have a glass of urine. So you mix this urine with apple juice, what are you going to gain from it? Are you going to say that the urine gets better because it's in the apple juice now or the apple juice is getting worse because the urine is there? That is integrative medicine. Something that works and something that does not work, you mix both. You are giving undue credit to the thing that does not work. So that is why even though we have this traditional knowledge and wisdom and all that, we don't have evidence of them actually working. But what if they invest time, resources into doing the research? W would, would you change your mind if you saw the research? I mean, see, I'm not denying the fact that there is no research. Huge research is going on 
in this aspect i mean look at our country i mean look at india every budget 3000 crore uh 3000 uh, crore inr is given to the ayush ministry to conduct research now it's been almost say 10 14 years and this research has been going on even before tell me one traditional ayurvedic formulation which is recommended or approved for any disease condition known to humans by any clinical society in the world we need an ayurvedic doctor for that no i mean i'll tell you the answer zero because i am treating patients for lot of disease conditions endocrinologists are treating there are there are guidelines for treatment of all disease conditions in the world and none of them feature ayurveda none of them feature homeopathy why because that is alternative medicine alternative medicine is medicine that has not proven to be working or has been disproven from working so that is why they are there and realistic medicine is here so th- this is i mean it will come out as a strong opinion no, on on evidence based medicine but for For, when i look at it from a patient perspective just imagine uh, i mean i'm t- i'm telling this from my own experience so i said i mean we have a lot of patients with hepatitis a right so hepatitis a patients have usually in 99% of patients the hepatitis a it presents with jaundice abnormal liver function and the patients have nausea vomiting general you know low appetite and all that for few weeks and then the jaundice settles within 4 to 6 weeks mm. that is what is hap- that is what is happening in 99% of patients so all they need is good nutrition simple supportive medications for nausea vomiting and all that and they are fine but imagine this patient is going to a, a traditional medicine healer or an ayurveda or a herbalist and they give him take these herbs for jaundice now some of these herbs are not tested they are not they are not evidence based herbs for this particular condition there is no data to it it's just based on their generation knowledge or ancient wisdom they are giving now instead of getting uh, better the herbs are going to cause liver injury herbal liver injury on top of hepatitis a so that patient instead of getting better within 4 to 6 weeks lands up in a hospital undergoes a liver biopsy takes about 2 to 3 months to uh, to for things to get improved spends more money than what is required hmm. so this is what happens when you mix something that is not evidence based with something that is evidence based or not okay right so that is why i want even ayurveda practitioners to bring to the table evidences not observation and faith based but actual evidences empirical evidence from studies and not just simple studies or reports proper clinical phase trials on evidence level 1 2 3 4 5 there are clinical levels of evidence that we have to follow Hmm. so evidence level 1 and clinical evidence 2 is the ultimate so if you have such data that be, that means that the treatment is going to be approved or recommended for that particular condition hmm. there is no such data okay um for, you know he's about lane norton and andrew yeah, human yeah, yeah. he's a yeah, biologist he's a neurobiologist, neurobiologist. Yeah, yeah. so i'm not i am an engineer who's <laughs> turned into a content creator there's no way that i'll be able to take you on in like disease based conversation I understand. we need like an ayurvedic person yeah, like yeah, for it yeah. okay but what i will give you again is little consumer perspective which is what we want you know um yeah. so uh, we spoke th- that that first theory like we spoke about that you can't take an old thing and just uh, an antiquity yeah appeal to antiquity appeal to antiquity or appeal to tradition yeah. recall my only reason for being open to appeal to antiquity is based on my own subjective life experience which is that until age 22 i was very against meditation pranayama all yoga also yeah and as life has moved forward not only have i become open to it based on my own experiences but uh, it benefited my own subjective reality meditation specifically and um, from a personal personal sp- yeah. perspective which is where i think a lot of ayurved cheer leaders come from that maybe in their subjective reality it may have helped them exactly so these are known as anecdotal experiences yeah. Yeah. which so, is not part of the scientific methodology it just makes people open to the possibility because also say again i'm using meditation yoga and pranayam as three yeah. uh, kind of topics amongst a vast number of misunderstood or ununderstood topics from ancient wisdom yeah. i feel like these three have been researched upon and are being researched upon very actively actively yes uh, but but then uh, we are still waiting for good levels of evidence on all of these you know i mean there are 
preliminary evidence that says that there are it has usefulness in certain group of group of patients or certain group of disorders but we are waiting for like i said clinical levels of evidence 1 2 3 4 and 5 5 is basically like this i mean personal anecdotes and opinions then comes case reports case series randomized controlled trials then comes meta analysis of these trials and then comes umbrella review of those meta analysis of trials which is a huge that is the ultimate evidence so until we have that we will not recommend it that is how the scientific medicine works i i understand what you're saying i think all these domains are trying to explore just what's on that other side of the wall exactly which also brings me to that urine apple juice thing yeah. <laughs> i understand what you're saying because yeah. probably you've seen patients who have gone to an ayurvedic doctor and things have not resulted good they've actually created a bigger problem for you as a medical doctor and that's why you view it as urine <laughs> instead of whatever it is yeah i mean, in, I mean it's supposed to it doesn't make apple juice better but it makes it worse in my science is definitely apple juice but i view this whole world of ancient wisdom not as urine but as cloudy grape juice like in terms of there there might be a lot of gunk there but yeah. it's it's yet to be researched upon and understood like i would like to see decades of a uh, scientific research going into the direction of if all the ancient wisdom be it south american chinese indian yeah. uh after decades of research because your industry which is medical science has had decades of research yes. behind it so it's the advantage your argument has in the first place yeah so but it should be structured research you know i mean i'm not denying the fact that you know yoga or ayurveda or homeopathy has no research yeah. i mean they are doing a lot of they have their own journals and they have their own yeah. publications everything but it's not structured the way it has to be you know right. you cannot use that as a modus operandi for you know treating patients because just because it's there yeah see i mean if 10 20 years later we have the same conversation and the uh, compass has not moved at all like if your uh, the argument that you're making now still valid then then i'll be completely on your side yeah But i need 10 years we'll have this conversation yeah, i need to wait for like 2 3 more decades honestly I understand. unless I understand. someone does like very ferociously fast research which i don't think is possible it takes time it Because takes time but then i understand that you know ayurveda is not something that has come yesterday it has been there for centuries it we have been doing it for decades and yeah. still what would another a couple of decade yeah. add to it one one last point i'll make is yeah. uh, see like i started this podcast in many ways for curio- for my own curiosity yeah. you know to ask questions to further my own understanding right. rather than to uh, just like put forward what i think and i began there and after meeting so many people i've really begun to think that okay true knowledge is knowing that you know nothing mm, that yeah. allows you to like keep expand which is why i'm like you know nudging. i understand so, i understand yeah but i've also noticed that people who come from a scientific background be it yourself be a dr huberman even two scientific temperament oriented people for example you're disagreeing with dr huberman on some stuff i yes i do disagree on some right. stuff yeah uh, but he has got a really good uh, outlook at how the neurobiology is and especially his old, older videos fantastic but, but some of them are not both of you all are still following the same scientific structure of thought i feel yeah. at least or uh, at least your own yeah yeah i mean it, it does he does that but then uh, there are instances where uh, he just blindly promotes based on very low so, levels of evidence so the consumer angle is perhaps and i'm not accusing you of anything sir yeah. but maybe even you are doing the same thing like this is the consumer perspective yeah i'm not accusing you at all yeah no i understand where this comes from but huberman is not a clinical doctor right so i would not take his advice as clinical advice at all i am a clinical doctor and when i treat patients or i talk about treatments they are always evidence based and they are not based on flimsy preclinical evidence consumer perspective that's what huberman also says that it's all evidence based so yeah, yeah. In, so that's where we have this domain expertise right you have to yeah. i'm yeah. i'm viewing you both as champions of science one is spider man with certain powers one is iron man with certain powers <laughs> so all i can do is observe what you guys are seeing but i feel like some human emotion and some human biases always come yeah, into science yeah so uh, i'm i'm saying that and i'm i'm giving additional pictures to it sure. you know so somebody says that you know this is what is given in this evidence so this is what you should take i'm saying that you know this is also there so take this also into consideration i'm not saying that this is completely wrong or completely right i'm saying that there is a balance and it's a logical balance that people can take for themselves because i am very transparent in putting up my evidence there yeah huberman may hide proper evidence or may not hide i don't know but whenever there is evidence that is hidden i just bring it out and i don't do it for everything there are certain areas where i feel that there is a misinformation that's all 
I need to have Doctor Huberman on the show with wow. you too. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. I mean, like I said, it has to be on the same page, right? Everything has to be on the same page. I mean, for or against, it has to be on the same page, and then people balance. benefits to risk ratio regarding that particular intervention and then take the right call yeah. and that is what we are doing here also again this is like little meta but on a human level this is what life is in terms of you observe of the world and then eventually you do what you yeah. think is best observe test validate replicate okay that's it if you enjoyed this clip from the ranvi show we've uploaded a ton of other clips related to a ton of other topics so explore the channel because there's something for everyone